Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody. I, I just have one request of the OWASP organizers. Please don't ever make me follow Shannon Leitz again. <laughs> oh, my God. That was the best talk I've heard in a long time. That was, that was amazing. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to scare you, but this was kind of a sexy title, and I thought, you know, it would pull people in. Um, thank you to those of you who fell for it. Um, but also, there are other, three other great talks, including Matt Tesoro's talk, so I'm amazed anybody showed up here at all. So, thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, well, th things, some things that we already have been discussing almost ad nauseum, but other things that I don't know if we're thinking about enough. We've been talking a lot about the erosion of trust um, in general, in society, for a lot of reasons. First of all, you know, we all know about psyops going on, about fake news, um, about you know, overly broad collection of data and profiling and manipulation of data and so on. Um, where we, of course, we always hear about breaches. In fact, my mother, uh, my my uh, husband asked me this morning, "Okay, who got pwned this week?" Because you know, whenever I come back from a trip, that's how we make conversation. I I know it's it's kind of sad. But he said, "Who got pwned this week?" And I said, "I don't know. I I didn't have chance to pay attention. I was on the oh wait, Cathay Pacific." Yeah, I read about them. So there's always something to talk about when I get home. There's lots of um, breaches and bad stewardship going on. But what I want to talk about, because can it get worse? Absolutely. Yes, it can get worse. Let's talk about how this could become a system attack. How could this become systematized? And I don't think we're talking enough about data integrity attacks. That's what really worries me these days. Um, the, the subtle or overt corruption of data, it, it, either to cause failure or to undermine trust, because the flip side of this is that you can simply accuse somebody of having a data integrity attack and they can't prove a negative. So, you know, you can simply accuse somebody of having a breach and all of a sudden they are as slammed with incident response as if they actually had one. It's mostly their PR and legal people who are on, on the spot there to deal with it. But they are, uh, you know, they have to respond to it as if it's a real attack and they may never be able to, you know, prove that it wasn't. Now, before I go any further, please, please do not say blockchain. Any blockchain fans here in the audience? If so, you can fight me. Fight me later. Um, but uh, I'll explain why. Uh, yes, blockchain is good for some things. And in fact, um, in a lot of ways, blockchain has been developed to try to address these trust issues for very particular sets of circumstances or situations. So, you know, what if one person is um, you know, is corrupting data. Okay, let's do consensus. Uh, what if we are, are pretty sure of something and we don't want to be, it to be corrupted later? Sure, let's make it immutable. Um, so those are ways of addressing that risk, but it's not good in a lot of other cases, and I'll talk about why. Uh, so first of all, no, there is no kitty porn on the blockchain, and this is an example of accusing something Somebody started a rumor, and even though technically speaking there cannot be any kiddie porn on the blockchain, maybe there could be a URL that's pointing to something that has kiddie porn on it or something like that. But there is no kiddie porn on the blockchain, but the fact that somebody brought this up to undermine trust in the blockchain is, you know, makes my point. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the other example of not being able to prove a negative, uh, Michael Lee spent two years traveling with a honeypot laptop. And er he left it in his hotel room, and every time he came back, he would try to figure out, to his satisfaction, whether it had been tampered with. And he tried this for two years in a lot of different circumstances, and he could never prove the negative to his own satisfaction. He could never prove that it wasn't tampered with. So this is a big problem uh, when we're dealing with the idea of data integrity attacks. So they're less noticeable than outright denial of service attacks. They're, um, and the detecting the origin of it requires deep event logging that most organizations are not in any position to be able to do. Um, 
maybe because I don't know of any organization that logs absolutely everything, every write, every read, and they usually don't do it until they're pretty sure there's been a breach and then they crank it up to debugging level, but by then it's too late. You've missed a lot of the important events. Uh, so uh, you need time references. You need to be able to figure out when the corruption happened. And depending on all the different dependencies that cascade down from that data based on all the decisions you might have made, based on the data, the changes, the adaptations, you may need to revalidate data at scale depending on how many changes have happened since that initial corruption event. And again, most organizations are not in any position to be able to do this. If you think about some examples of data integrity tax, we've thought about um, a lot of financial transaction things. That's where everybody thinks first. But if you think about some examples like uh, legal contracts, they're, they're kind of like code in that even punctuation is very important and it's argued about. Can you imagine standing up in front of a judge and saying, Your Honor, you'll see on page 85 it says, and the judge says, that's not what page 85 says. Can you imagine all of the billable hours that have gone into wordsmithing something in a contract or legislation and then finding out that somebody at the last minute that somebody's changed it but you're not really sure how? Think of all the money that would cost in billable hours or somebody just threatening to do it. Somebody calling up a law firm and saying, I have the ability to change the language in your writing and you won't be able to tell where. Uh, unless you pay me. That, that's really scary. Or if that's too scary to contemplate, think about maybe cha in food manufacturing, changing the recipe for your favorite mac and cheese microwave dinner. Um, you know, taking the salt out of it or something. But boy, that would be awful. So um, there are a lot of different ways that you can think about the corruption of business data that we haven't done yet. And the problem is that businesses tend to be siloed or they're in silos, or as I like to call them, cylinders of excellence. <laughs> they don't necessarily question the data that comes from another department. You know, they don't, if you ask somebody, do you check the data that comes over from, you know, this other business area? They'll go, no, it's, it's in a batch job. It comes in every day. We, you know, we deal with it. They're not used to treating other departments as potentially hostile sources of data. So they're not going to be validating it. Um, the fraud department doesn't necessarily care about non-financial or non-transaction data. Uh, this is a problem particularly in retail where you will see a big gap between cybersecurity teams and the fraud department because, uh, for example, with account takeover attacks, uh, the cybersecurity department cares a lot if the wrong person logs into a customer account. The fraud department doesn't care until they start trying to initiate a fraudulent transaction with that account. So there's this gap between the two of them. Uh, so the fraud department is not looking at potential misuses of data that have nothing to do with, with financial transactions. And then finally, big data has not been emphasizing integrity or inventory of data. It's just been about collecting as much as possible. We all know developers who collect everything possible in case they might need it later, in case the, biz the business comes back and says, okay, we have a new requirement to do this. Oh, good, we already have the data for that. So for years, people have been you know, hoarding data without much uh, cause to think about what they have, which is why I say, and I really am standing on the, on the stage and saying it, thank goodness for GDPR. And why, you might ask? Because it's making the businesses finally look at why, why they have what they have and whether they can get rid of it. They are finally starting to regard data as potentially toxic at, at scale, and this is a good thing. It's not going to be solving the data integrity attack problem, but it's a good start. So uh, despite everything, uh, I, I still think that at least making us think about business data is a good thing. Now let's talk about another reason not to trust what we have. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about malicious um, design or what they call dark patterns in user interface design. This is a great example. 
Um, this was from a banner ad on, on uh, a mobile uh, a website that appears on a mobile phone. If you see the little smudge there, that's actually part of the banner ad. It's designed to get you to touch it on your phone and try to get rid of the smudge, and that clicks on the banner ad and it monetizes it. Isn't that fiendishly clever? That, that's just, uh, everybody is now mentally going, uh, they want to get rid of it. That this, is, this is just one simple example of a dark pattern in UI design. There are, there are many others, and this is a great site, darkpatterns.org, if you want to see examples of this. Um, if you want to see um, things like examples of bait and switch where you think you're choosing something and they give you something else. Or if you, f you, um, you know, put one thing in your cart and you end up with a bunch of other, of other things added to your cart. Um, there's confirm shaming. I'm sure everybody's seen this, especially when it comes to booking airplane tickets and somebody asks you if you want to get the travel insurance and you have to click on, no, I choose not to protect my investment. <laughs> That's, yeah, yes, I want to have the orphans starve. That there's that kind of language that manipulates us into trying, you know, into clicking or adding on things that we don't necessarily want. There's misdirection. Um, I read about one um, airplane ticket booking site where there was a link to choose your seats, but it, ch it charged you five pounds to choose your seat on the plane. And there was another much smaller link someplace else where you could do it for free. But the bigger one always made you click on that one first and they got the five pounds out of you without uh, you, you realizing that there could have been another way to do that. There's the Roach Motel where you check in and you can't check out. We have been conditioned to expect certain sequences in our workflows when you're doing something uh, on a website. And if you get down a rabbit hole and there's no real way to get back out again, that's an example of the Roach Motel. Uh, finally, there are trick questions like, do you not want to yes cancel the other thing that you canceled? Confirm. Yes. Um, th th we've seen things like that. Sometimes it's just really bad phrasing. Sometimes it's intended to be confusing so that you're not really sure what you're doing. Uh, one example uh, of how we're being manipulated with user interfaces is uh, my oldest when he was about three or four before he could even read. Uh, we used to let him play on kid websites and we came in and found him in the middle of downloading and installing a browser plugin. And, th and this was before he could read, he didn't know what he was doing. But we figured out that he must have learned over time that when something popped up in the middle of what he was trying to do, there were usually two choices, two boxes, and one of them was highlighted darker than the other one. That's the default choice. And he must have discovered that if he clicked on that, it would make the pop-up go away and he could go back to what he was doing. So he learned to select the default choice, even without knowing what he was choosing, until he got to the EULA, which did not have a default choice on. It was a you know, agree or disagree, and he didn't know what to choose in that point, and that's when we walked in and found him stuck in the middle of this download. So even our kids are being conditioned by user interfaces to choose certain things and do certain things. And we don't think about how much we trust these UIs until we get to the point where we actually can't trust them. Uh, there are other techniques. There, there's the abuse of the intuitive parts of, of the UI. For example, here in the United States, red means something bad, red means danger. In China, it means good fortune. So, you know, which one would you be choosing, you know, automatically? Red, yellow, and green, highlighting something in red to kind of subconsciously drive somebody away from that choice. Um, tick boxes or radio buttons. We are used to seeing that radio buttons usually represent one choice. You can't select many of them. If you choose one and then choose another, it moves the dot to the other, the other radio button. Whereas with tick boxes, we're used to kind of expecting that you can choose more than one um, option on that, potentially. You could play with that and, and confuse people so that they don't realize that they can choose more than one thing. Um, we have about, oh God, it's like 10 or 15 designers at Duo. And I got them together one day and I said, you know, they, they spend a lot of time doing research on how to make it easy and intuitive for people to do the right thing. And I thought, what if you used your powers for evil? 
What could you drive them to do? And they came up with some pretty devilish ideas. Um, creating anxiety through artificial scarcity. I'm sure you've seen that. Only four tickets left. You know, buy this. How many of you start to fill out a form and think, oh God, I've got to finish it, otherwise the session's going to time out and I'll have to do it all over again. So you feel the subconscious pressure to finish what you're doing and do it as quickly as possible because you don't know when the timeout's going to come. Um, how many of you are sitting here subconsciously wondering about the battery level on your phone? It's just a pervasive thing all the time that we are now living with, that our kids are living with, um, this anxiety tied to technology that could be used to manipulate us. And the goal is to make the user make a security decision that's not in their best interests. The other problem is, well, with malicious design, it's not additional code. It's not like malware. It's not like you could go in and find it unless you knew what you were looking for. Unless you understood design and looked at it and said, you know, this is so bad that this ha has to be on purpose. The problem is that we've seen so many bad UIs. In my lifetime, in 30 years of IT, I have seen so many bad UIs. And the thing is that we used to design these things for one another when it was a smaller community 30 years ago. We all uh, had the same background of knowledge. So you could describe something as being intuitively obvious. And it, you would almost be right that you know anybody who looked at it could understand how it was supposed to work. But that's not who we write for anymore. We write for the world. We write for people who have no background in this, and they shouldn't have to have but we cannot assume that they're going to make the same assumptions about how something works that we do. So engineering grade UIs need to become a thing of the past. We need UIs that are, are as easy as using a spoon. You know, you get taught to use a spoon when you're a toddler, and after that, you pick one up, you pretty much know how it works. Um, but there are rabbit holes and malicious design and counterintuitive design in our technology today that we are living with that is not getting, you know, not getting resolved. It's not getting fixed to the point where anybody can understand what's going to happen when they do something. So this is a really important thing that we need to work on if we want to establish more trust in the applications that we write. And finally, we can't trust ourselves. Uh, that, that's a big problem. First of all, there's bias. And uh, we've been discovering bias, especially in algorithms where we're teaching, um, we're doing machine learning and teaching them with historic data and then realizing, oh, that, you know, we were doing some pretty bad things. I don't know if you read about the discovery that Amazon made uh, when they were trying to teach um, and develop algorithms using historical data of the resumes that they had received and the people that they hired. And they discovered systemic bias in, um, in who they were hiring and which kind of language the, hi the hiring managers would tend to shy away from, and that got encoded in the algorithm. So if somebody didn't put things in a particular way, um, that candidate would be thrown out by the algorithm. And we discovered, oh, gee, we were missing a lot of really good candidates that way. So there's, there's a lot that we're discovering about ourselves as we develop machine learning and, and discovering how our own wetware works and, and sometimes doesn't work well, which is why people like Amit Elazari are calling for things like bug bounties in algorithms. There are also organizations, nonprofits, that are trying to do this, to, do, to discover and highlight bias in algorithms, but we need to do this we need a new immune system. And by the way, Amida Lazari is, is the sister of Karen Lazari, who gives, gave her TED talk about the hacker immune system. So that you can see how the, you know, the phrase, the, the immune system in security is becoming um, a thing with, uh, with these two professionals. The other thing is our own incapability, and I'm the, gonna be the first to stand up here and say, yeah, I, I'm not capable of a lot of things. I don't know if you saw this great interview with uh, Damon Cortese several years ago, um, with uh, Tripwire did this, where he uh, had been a researcher in security for a long time, knew all about how not to do things. Uh, he decided to take time and build his own application, 
And he spent all the time coding it and getting it functional, and then he went back and looked at it and found that he had put all sorts of security flaws in it. Which leads me to believe that we cannot um, hold two states in our brains simultaneously. We cannot make something functional in coding and also simultaneously abuse it or debug it. It used to be that my father, who wrote one of the first, first Fortran compilers, used to be able to program in his head. And he used to be able to debug in his head. So somebody would call him and say, you know, they found a problem with something he wrote, and he would sit in his chair and he'd think for a long time. And then he'd go, ah, I know where it is. And he'd be able to fix it. You can't do this anymore with the type of software that we write. It's, it's just not possible. You can't hold all of that in your head. And you also can't abuse what you created sufficiently. You need somebody else to help you do that. Uh, here's another example of the subtlety of data corruption and our inability to be able to diagnose it. So Raphael Zotter, who is uh, an, a journalist, a cybersecurity journalist with the Associated Press, um, told me this story. His father, David Zotter, is also a journalist, was targeted by Cyber Berkut uh, with tainted leaks of David Zotter's email messages. Um, and they were um, changed to make it look like he was a CIA operative. Now, he was able to, you know, he had the own originals of his own email, and he had the leaked, um, corrupted emails, and was able to compare them side by side. And his son, who was very savvy in cybersecurity, was able to help him look for things, but they didn't, always, they didn't catch everything that Cyber Bear could have done to his emails. Here's an example of one of the things when Citizen Lab started to help them, they found this. They deleted these things in red to make it look like he was doing a much more, uh, a much broader campaign around, um, you know, investigate around his project. So he was only helping the Radio Liberty Russian service. But, and he was writing his email in that context. But if you delete it, it looks like he has a much broader Russian investigative reporting project is gaining traction um, and producing significant journalism for what? And the thing is, they didn't see this because they were looking and comparing the text in a certain way. They were looking for changes in wording. They were looking for changes in text size, and looking for changes in punctuation but they weren't necessarily looking at the same time for changes in meaning, especially if you deleted something, how it would produce a broader and more slanted um, interpretation. So again, this is a case where we can't necessarily diagnose everything ourselves when we're trying to discover how data integrity has been messed with. Now, how do we defend against this? Because I want to cheer everybody up. Everybody looks really sad right now. Um, first of all, we need to be able to trust ourselves, which means we need to be able to diagnose and address you know, the, the sources of the lack of capability. We need to understand our own limitations. We need to be able to work around them and compensate for them. And we need to be able to earn the trust from others. We can't just say, trust us. You know, trust us, we're from the government. Trust us, we're from, you know, pick your large company. Uh, that's just not gonna work. We have to be able to earn that trust. So how can we do that? Here are a few you know, things that I just came up with off the top of my head. Honest, obviously, being honest is a really good start. But being transparent, talking about everything that somebody might want to know or need to know about something is a little different from being honest. It's telling not only the truth, but all of the truth. And this is a problem that we have with breach disclosure that uh, you know, most organizations are very tightly hemmed in by their legal and PR departments about what they can say. They very carefully wordsmith what they can say because they're managing a different type of risk. They're, they're managing the risk of you know, this kind of text-based PR attack. Um, but they need to be able to be transparent and say, here's what happened, here's you know, what we did, here's what we did wrong. We need predictability as well. If you can trust somebody to, um, to uh, follow their own interests, that's a certain kind of predictability. You can always be sure that somebody who's in the marketing business is going to try to drive you know, 
drive consumers to their product. But if somebody is very capricious and just doing things because they want to watch the world burn, they're, you, know, you never know what they're going to do next and they're not as predictable and therefore you can't trust them. Capability, they might have the best intentions in the world, but if they can't follow through on it, you still can't trust them. The willingness to correct mistakes, and again, this comes into play in security a lot. We, we, we have to face this uh, a, a lot. And accountability. So sometimes just saying I'm gonna hold myself accountable isn't enough, which is why we have regulations and legislation. When we feel that there's a big enough societal risk that there's, it's not enough to be able to just trust the market on its own or trust the people in the market on their own, it, you have to be able to um, have somebody else holding you know, this organization accountable. And sometimes you feel better at that point because you know they have skin in the game. Now, remember trustworthy computing? Does everybody remember that? Um, the thing was that when Microsoft came up with this phrase, they were talking about building software that would work as advertised and uh, was not going to be able to be abused in a security way, but it didn't necessarily address whether you could trust the people using the software or the company writing the software. That, that was different. You know, whether you could trust the organization to have your interests in mind as opposed to theirs. That was an aspect of trustworthy computing that didn't really come through. And of course now they've kind of broken up that team, the trustworthy computing group within Microsoft. So I'm not really sure where that is now. The other thing is, is zero trust an answer? Okay, can we not trust anything? And the TLDR on that is yes and no. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about what zero trust really means and a lot of people saying, oh my God, don't trust anything. I like to think of it as just saying, don't trust something just because it's on the inside of your firewall. Now the thing is that John Kindervog at Forrester came up with this phrase, zero trust, and he and I argue about what it really means because I believe there's a semantic difference in how people look at it. John thinks about it in terms of where trust means granting something access without validating it, which I agree you should never do. But there's another way to look at it, which is to say that trust means granting access because you verified it. And that's why you'll hear companies like Duo talking about trusted access, where Kinder Raw goes, no, 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 never trust anything. So I think we have to find, you know, uh, we have to understand these two different semantic differences in order to figure out what it really means for us. Does anybody remember Crusade? This was the spin-off of Babylon 5. Yeah, yeah, I, I miss Crusade. Um, in, in their show opening, they ask questions that are really, really germane to what we should be asking any user or any system when we're figuring out whether we can trust them, whether, whether we're figuring out how to build trustworthy systems. The first one, of course, is who are you? We have to solve the identity problem. And we have to find out what do you want? What do you want to do? And we talk about where are you going? Which, which application are you accessing and what do you want to do with it? And who do you serve and whom do you trust? Who are you doing this on behalf of? Because that often makes a difference on, in terms of the type of trust you're going to grant them within an application. If you're working on behalf of this organization, there are certain business rules that have to come into play. If you're working on behalf of that organization, maybe you have to do it separately. You have to do it in a different session because legally you've, you can't mix the, screen, the streams, you can't cross the streams. So you have to talk, you know, you have to talk in terms of who are they working on behalf of and whom do they trust? because trust is transitive and you can be affected by trusting someone who trusts the wrong people or for the wrong reasons. So we have to ask all of those things. Because fundamentally, trust is neither binary nor is it permanent. Um, you know, my team trusts me to get up here and talk to people in public, but they do not trust me to do a deployment because I have a talent for breaking things. So, you know, they won't trust me all the time for anything, which is the problem that we had with the firewall is that the, the type of trust that was embodied in that was both binary and permanent. Are you coming from the right IP? Yeah, come on in, do whatever, do anything. And that leads to lateral movement and all, all sorts of things. And um, 
you know, we always trusted them all the time for anything. And the thing is that CISOs tend to think about trust in terms of it degrading over time, that, or that the risk can grow over time. Uh, the risk can grow that something has been compromised. And so at some point, you need to revalidate everything. The question is, at what point do you want to revalidate them? Because here's the problem with never trusting anything all the time. If you have users and you are asking them to re-authenticate with every web request because you don't ever trust them, they're going to get very cranky. So the zero trust model may work really well in system to system relationships where they don't care how many times you ask them to authenticate. But for users, it's a very different story and you have to be able to accommodate um, their need not to have that much friction but at the end, their need to have your trust for a certain amount of time. This is why you have to explain to them, this is why we're making you re-authenticate because the risk has grown in the meantime that your you know, device has gone out of date and it might have gotten compromised in some way. Or we're not sure you're the same person anymore. Have you ever, I'm sure you've typed in um, you know, something like a social security number or a bank account number into a form and clicked submit and immediately you can't read it anymore because they've started out. Because we as security professionals said, you have to hide this because the next time somebody logs in, it could be not that person. But I'm in the same session and I just typed this in, why won't you let me see this anymore? That's another example of not trusting for long enough um, because, of, um, because of context. So we need to be able to ask what conditions need to be true for you to be able to trust an entity or a person? Uh, on, on what basis are you trusting them? What do you trust them to do and for how long? And, and these are the things that we should be working on. But I want to ask you this hard question. What happens to a community if there's no trust? This is the other problem with zero trust. And what happens to a society without trust? Because we're at a point where we are using so much technology and there are lots of reasons why we may not be able to trust it. So what's going to happen here? This is particularly endemic inside of the security community because we are all trying to catch each other out on things. You know, Shannon made some really great points there about, you know, get off my lawn and pointing things out. Um, you know, we, we hack each other. You know, everybody knows Chris Roberts, Side Dragon, um, who claimed to have hacked a plane in flight and made it fly sideways. Well, I got him. Uh, there was drinking involved, and uh, he was showing us some photos on his phone. I said, oh, can I see? I can't see very well. Can I hold your phone? And he forgot I was holding it, and so this came out on Twitter. <laughs> because nobody sees the middle-aged former state bureaucrat and mother of two coming. <laughs> I am not in your threat model. So, the, you know, this happens all the time. I, I got Rob Graham, too. We were, we were co-presenting at DEF CON, and I, I said, oh, I didn't bring my laptop. I just brought my presentation on this USB drive. Could I use yours? And he said, sure, and plugged it in. Boom. But, I, you know, I, I, I didn't hack him. We shouldn't be hacking each other because if we can't trust each other, we cannot communicate as much as we need to in order to solve problems. If all we're doing is going, ooh, you missed a spot, that does not engender trust. Uh, if we don't have enough trust between organizations, we can't do threat intelligence exchange. We can't do it to the extent that we need to. So if everybody's you know, hiding and being defensive because they expect that at any moment somebody's going to point out something that they missed, um, that is not you know, going to serve us going forward. So we need to think about that. Again, if we were going to design a system worthy of trust, if we were going to design an organization wor worthy of trust, we would think about what we're doing with the data and describing to the user how we're using the data, not just, oh, we're going to use it to improve your experience. But no, this is who we're giving it to and why. This is, this is what we're allowing you to opt out of. This is you know, what we have. This is how often we will remind you about this. Um, I saw a great 
uh, sort of subway map that Michelle Dennity, who is Cisco's um, chief privacy officer, came up with a very clear and beautiful subway map that shows exactly where uh, a company's data went in their systems, in their applications, and what it was being used for. And if we can show this very clearly in ways that people can understand instead of walls of legal text, we will do a lot better to engender trust from them. We need to be predictable. We need to understand what the system is going to do. And this is very hard the more complex the software gets and the more complex the dependencies get. But we have to keep driving for predictability. We have to find ways of getting that confidence that Shannon talked about. We have to be able to know whether we are figuring this out well enough to be able to do this. We have to be able to correct our mistakes in public if we need to and say, yeah, that was our bad. And we need that accountability. So if we want to reinforce trust, yes, we need prevention, which a lot of people think about, which includes the well understood processes and the protection of data. We need the ability to detect changes to our data and changes to our systems. But most importantly, and this is where you know, um, blockchain kind of falls down, we need the ability to correct it. Because if it's anything we know for sure, it's that we are going to make mistakes, that we have to make changes. We have to make corrections in a trustworthy way. We have to be able to go, yeah, this is wrong. We know this was wrong on your credit report. We know this wasn't you. We're going to change it now, and everybody's going to believe the change. So we need a good system for correcting data. And this is how we're going to be able to battle denial of trust attacks against data. We need a good, trustworthy process for correction. So yes, we need things like continuous authentication where we can get away with it, where we can hide it from the user. We need data validation and lots of it, especially in between those cylinders of excellence that we, you know, we automatically trust and maybe you know, we need to do some verification before we trust them. We need better transparency and we need accountability. What we do not need is to hash all the things. Even though hash is very tasty, I just had some fabulous hash in, for breakfast in Montreal. Oh my God, it was so good. Um, it had foie gras on the side. Now, and you know that was like some next level hash. But we do not need to hash all the things because data in general is dynamic. We need, a, we need something better than blockchain to be able to get trust in our data, and it is going to be harder. But I you know, will ask all of you, all of you smart people, to get you know, to thinking about this if you're not already. If you are already thinking about this, please come and talk to me because I would love to hear about it. Now here's the, the conclusion that I came to when I was making this talk, and I'm still not sure it's right, but, uh, and I, if you think I'm wrong and can, can convince me, I would love to hear about it, but I do not think that we can separate trustworthy systems from trustworthy people. In other words, I don't think we can build a system that in itself can resist attempts to abuse it. And I know we're trying to do this. I know people have tried to do it for decades. We've tried to do mathematical levels of assurance on code and all that kind of stuff. But as we keep seeing the misuse of applications and software, I'm just not convinced that we are capable of building something that even we can't abuse, that even we can't hack. And so, um, you know, th this is a problem too. But so th it is not a problem that can be solved by purely technological means. It's a problem that we have to solve in society at the same time as we're working on the technology. But again, if you think I'm wrong, please, please come fight me. No, uh, come, come tell me about it because I would really love to be able to change this slide. But in the meantime, um, we've got to stop scaring people. This is our, our um, senior director of video production at Duo. He used to do uh, music videos for MTV. And, you know, this is hypnotic. I could watch it all day. But the point is that we need to step away from the very simple, you know, threat models that we always talk about. We need to get away from the hoodies and stop scaring people because we are not going to get them to trust us unless we put down the hoodie and you know, start presenting ourselves as the fallible and yet well-intentioned, capable community that we are, 
I think we will do a lot better that way. That's it. Thank you very much for coming. I look forward to talking.